everyone. I uh, would like to welcome you to the Louise Leakey Memorial Hall. My name is Lucy Warwenge, Executive Director of African Conservation Center. So I would like, as we open, to invite Dr. Kibunja Mzalendo, the Director General of National Museums of Kenya, so he can welcome us as the host. I am very happy that Dr. Western today is coming to speak here 50 years after what I would call paradigm shift on how to manage Kenya's wildlife. Welcome to the National Museums of Kenya where heritage lives on. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite Dr. John Waidaka, who is the chairman of the Kenya Wildlife Service Board, who will introduce our speaker, Dr. Weston. I'm Jambo, uh, the DG NMK, Dr. David Weston, colleagues in conservation, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great day to be here today to hear from one of our most prominent conservationists on the continent who has been here for, uh, I think, all his life. Uh, but before I invite him to give uh, the speech, I would like to point out a few things. The people in this room, I presume, have one thing in common. They all value wildlife. And people who value wildlife have, in my view, the right attitude to this life. During the time of Kenya in the making, the issue of the value of wildlife and its habitat was clearly and publicly stated by none other than the first president of the Republic of Kenya during the General Assembly of IUCN in Nairobi on September 18, 1963. The president had a great vision. He saw the value of wildlife and its habitat. And according to him, the value was priceless. And what he defined as priceless was wildlife, wildlife habitats, and forests. Wildlife has great values and benefits. And these benefits he identified as one, these places are beautiful. We need to keep that, that beauty. If there is nothing else, we need to keep that beauty. Two, that these places are important for the survival of man and beast. So protecting these areas, according to him, was about lives and livelihoods. Before I invite Dr. David Weston to offload on us what he has learned over the last 50 years, I would like us to reflect a bit on President Kenyatta's vision for Kenya. Dr. Weston understands what needs to be done in order to successfully conserve wildlife. We have worked together in the NGO world, in KWS, and in the global conservation arena. For those who do not know him, Dr. Weston is a real Kenyan. He studied at the University of Nairobi, like many of us, when that was the only university in Kenya. Dr. Weston directed Wildlife Conservation Society programs internationally, chaired the African Elephant and Rhino Specialist Group, was the founding president of the International Ecotourism Society and a former director of the Kenya Wildlife Service. He was a founder of the African Conservation Center in Nairobi, is the patron of the wildlife clubs of Kenya, and was for many years an adjunct professor of biology at the University of California, San Diego. His lecture today has the title Kenya Wildlife, a success story still in the making. And that's a question. Welcome, Dr. David West. Well, John, you've done me a great service by reading the declaration of the first president of Kenya, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta.
I was going to read that in detail because of all the things that I'm going to say, it seems to me that that seminal statement which the president made at the time of independence is still the guiding light for Kenya today. And I want in particular to point out that they said, as John noted, that our natural resources, our wildlife, our forests are a priceless heritage. We all depend on them. But he also said something else which is very important, beautiful, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But I want to take you back to the days before independence. At that time, I grew up in Tanzania, so I was very familiar with what was happening. The colonial governments were very concerned that the African independent governments would not set aside areas for wildlife. So there was a great rush to set aside national parks. And one very eminent British biologist, Sir Julian Huxley, said, any country without a national park is not civilized. Think about that. Britain didn't have a single national park at that point. <laughs> Kenya had many. So what I want to do is point out that the unique thing about the president is he loved nature. And if there's any doubt, all you have to do is go to the remnants of the pavilion that he set up on the shores of the, Nash, of the Flamingo area, Natron. He used to love to sit there and look out on the flamingos. He used to go down to Masai Mara and enjoy wildlife there. In 1977, I was asked to set up the, the wildlife planning unit for Kenya. And one of the calls I got through the uh, provincial commissioner was from none other than the president himself. And he said, I would like you to go down to Elementiter and try and set that aside as a national park because he fully realized that that was also a beautiful park and that was the site of the pelican breeding. Unfortunately, when I went down to see Lord Delamere, he didn't think he was ever going to die. The very fact that I would raise the issue beyond his time was really not something he took too kindly to. But I'm actually delighted to say that regardless of the fact that it didn't become a national park, as John has noted, it is the private sector that has taken such big steps since then. So let's look at the record right after independence and ask what successes has Kenya had despite all the reservations? Despite the fact that there were endless books like The End of the Game, Wildlife is Finished. There are now today four times more national parks in Kenya than there were at the time of independence. Tourism has become one of the engines of our economy, fulfilling all those expectations that it would attract people from all over the world. There was a great deal of sport hunting. That also was generating revenues from the government. But the point I want to make is this, and this is what impressed me when I first came here in 1967 to join the University of Nairobi as a young graduate student and figure out where we were going with wildlife. Wildlife was not a Kenyan thing. There were no visitors into the national parks who were Kenyans. There were no sport hunters who were Kenyans. So yes, it was generating money, but the very people who live with wildlife and who had, in effect, been the custodians over the years, were excluded. So I was interested with one very interesting question. My father had been involved in setting up national parks in Tanzania, particularly Mukumi National Park, but I saw the flip side of it as a young person, that these areas, which are called Shambhala Bibi, which is literally the place of the queen at that time, excluded people and dispossessed people. And so they called wildlife Ngombia Serakali. That's government cattle. They belong to other people and not to them. So the very custodians who'd lived with wildlife for eons were left out. And what interested me particularly was why there's so much wildlife throughout Kenya, even outside the national parks. And of course, we now know that the majority of wildlife is actually outside national parks. So I asked the one question which had always intrigued me growing up, and which at University in Leicester in the UK really struck me all the more. Why is it that this one continent of all places has such an abundance of wildlife when it's been exterminated everywhere around the world? And the really peculiar feature is that people in Africa live alongside wildlife, they coexist with wildlife.
So I chose the one area which was under the gun at the time to become a national park but still remained a county council area, Amboseli. And I went down there in 1967 and I spent two years looking at this question. Why is there coexistence in Africa? Why is there such an abundance of wildlife? And here's the key question. Not just an abundance of wildlife but even more livestock than there is wildlife. About two-thirds of the rangelands were livestock, only about a third wildlife. Now, how is it that they've managed to coexist? So after two years, I came back to actually the hall next door, the Ford Foundation, and I delivered a message, which didn't go down too well, and I'll explain that in a moment. First of all, one of the great discoveries and revelations from me, working with the Maasai, being given cattle, so that I could understand it through the eyes of a cow, is the migrations of wildlife and livestock are identical. They move the same places, the same time, for the same reason, to get better grass and to withdraw to the dry season areas to get themselves to the dry season. More than that, there was another phenomenon that came out during the droughts. Why would they tolerate wildlife alongside their own cattle? Not because they were considered government cattle, but because in Maasai traditions, they were considered their own second cattle. So in extreme droughts, they could depend on wildlife until their own herds built up again. So in the periods in between, tradition through the Liboni and others is protect wildlife because you'll need it when the time comes. So I came back to this hall and delivered what I thought was a fairly naive message at the moment. Surely, so many years after independence, the time has come to involve the very custodians of wildlife in the benefits of wildlife, particularly as tourism is building up. When I looked around the room at that time, there was one Kenyan, just one. Every single face here was white. Who was inheriting Kenya's wildlife? After the meeting, I had an old gentleman come up. In fact, he was even older than I was. And he said, in proposing community-based conservation, it sounds to me as though this is the last bastion of communism. Communism. But on a lighter note, two other gentlemen came up. One of them was the only Kenyan there. And they said, this is an interesting idea. We would like to invite you to the Institute for Development Studies down on Chirobo campus to really develop this idea further and ask the question, why has there been coexistence? Is there an alternative to national parks for all those other areas that don't have national parks? And even Amboseli itself, which was being targeted by the conservationists in this room at the time to become another national park. So the great benefit I had as a young student was being invited to the Institute for Development Studies and giving a lecture about how I felt the future of wildlife was not just within parks, but also outside parks. Because every single national park in Kenya and most of those in Tanzania too, had been built around the areas where wildlife was most prolific, and those were the dry season concentration areas. When I first went down to Amboseli, it was December 1967, there was hardly an animal inside the national park. Where had they gone? Why had they migrated? And it became self-evident to myself as a young student. Oh, I should mention one thing which is very important. The reason I chose the University of Nairobi, even though I had a very prestigious international grant to go anywhere in the world that I chose, is because the University of Nairobi, then the University of East Africa, was the only university anywhere in the world that had a graduate program in what we now call conservation biology. And I see many students here who have come through that same course, in fact, dozens and dozens of them, including the, act the acting director of Kenya Wildlife Service, John, Kamanga, uh, John uh, Waithaka, Lucy uh, Warungin, so on. So I think the enormous benefit of linking up with this remarkable group of economic reformists at the Institute of Development Studies is they fully understood that economics was what was going to drive wildlife in the eyes of the Kenya government, and in particular the Treasury, not Wildlife Ministry. And so they helped me develop some statistics that showed if we expanded 
this national reserve as it was at the time before it became a national park to the whole ecosystem and included the Maasai within those benefits, the revenues flowing into Mambaseli would be three times higher than those could be generated by the national park alone. Three times higher. It would also diversify the income and put it back to the Maasai community and to the county council. So out of that came the first step in Amboseli, despite the fact that the very president, who said really this is the benefit of Kenya people, declared it a national park, is that we're able to rescue a unique feature of what has become the wildlife approach to Amboseli, namely, the county council retained 400 acres inside the national park where it had a lodge, so those revenues went back to the county council, not to the national government. Secondly, and here's the really important point, we figured out how much wildlife spent how much time outside the national park and how much grazing the Maasai lost to that wildlife and set aside a thing what we now call payment for ecological services, that every single year the Maasai would be guaranteed that amount to maintain the migratory wildlife on their land. That scheme is still in place today and has funded scholarships of many, many people, including some I see down here today. Payment for ecological services. It's something we're only just beginning to think about, and it's something that worked for Amboseli. What then happened was all important. The Treasury got very interested in the revenue generated by Amboseli and pressed the case for the government to take over the national park, unfortunately, even though at the time we were pressing for a unique Maasai park. Nevertheless, because those revenues spread back, it did contain a great deal of the, the counter movement in Amboseli, spearing elephants, rhinos, and so on, to say, fine, we're finally betting from wildlife, so we'll go along with the government policy. The World Bank, on the basis of that, gave Kenya a tourism and wildlife loan of $40 million to develop tourism and to integrate wildlife and areas outside. That program today is still visible in areas like Lake Naivasha Institute, the Manyani Anti-Poaching Center, Training Center, the Air Wing, and many other facilities. It also had a very electric effect, and this is the Treasury bear in mind now, and the World Bank leaning on the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife to say the time has come to involve local people in conservation. They pressed against enormous resistance in the ministry to introduce a policy in 1997, 97 to 7, that still exists today and has not been supplanted by any other policy. And the basis of that policy was to look beyond national parks, to include large areas today which we call ecosystems, to introduce the idea of tourism beyond parks by spreading lodges outside parks, introducing the idea of ecotourism and so on and so forth. At the same time, the Kenya government, pressed by the World Bank, also brought in a trophy and a hunting ban. Not because it was injurious, mainly because there was no concern about it because the local people didn't benefit, but simply because it was solved by the Kenya government to say that since poaching is out of control and the World Bank would not give Kenya government that $40 million loan until it showed good faith in protecting wildlife. So the trophy and hunting ban had very little to do, quite frankly, with the state of wildlife or what effect that it had on them. It had to do with buying goodwill for the Kenya government to get that loan. Kenya government also then followed with legislation. And that legislation, again, has been very enduring over time. But one of the most important things about that legislation, based on the recognition that we had to conserve wildlife at an ecosystem scale, was the fusion of the Wildlife Conservation and Management Department and the National Parks into one body that could manage wildlife everywhere, including eventually John, the 1% of the national park, marine national parks set aside. A single agency, great idea. And at first it seemed to work, but that turned out to be the Achilles heel of the wildlife legislation. Why? Because the former national parks, up until this time, had been a sterling organization it was semi-autonomous, autonomous of government with its own board of trustees, able to set its own vision, its own programs. It was a highly effective organization. The game department by this time was highly corrupted. 
And once those two departments formed together, the national parks were submerged and subsumed and became a minor entity. What then broke out was a poaching holocaust, and for several reasons. One is that even at the highest level of our government at that time, there were people involved in the poaching syndicates. And that filtered down through the directors of wildlife all the way down through the ranges. And we figured out that the elephants during that period of time went down for 144,000 down to a mere 19,000 by the time the ivory ban, which I'll talk about, came in in 1998. But there was another reason. A government department, which is looking after wildlife, is considered a subordinate ministry when you stack it up against the ministries of education, agriculture, social services. So they always got a tiny amount of the budget, which was inadequate. And there was a third reason. And the third reason was equally important. The Wildlife Department at that time, through its ranges, only had single action 303s. At a time when the shifter were coming in from the north with AK-47s and gunning down whole herds of elephants and also gunning down rangers. They were completely overwhelmed. That was the Achilles heel we had to face up to. So the point I'm going to make from here on is that we've had some superb ideas about the future direction of wildlife in Kenya, and it's always been in the future. And the reason it's been in the future is because we've always held back from taking what I will call the third step, which is where I'll end up today. Another thing that came out of that period was twofold. Firstly, Kenya developed the idea and is now recognized as a pioneer of ecotourism. This is tourism outside parks involving local communities, communities as the custodians, and so on. And that's why I was asked to be the first president in forming the International Ecotourism Society. Again, a great Kenya idea. I look around the room here and I see members of the East African Wildlife Society, and that's the third element that became very important in Kenya. The East African Wildlife Society was extremely influential in beginning to build up a Kenyan constituency for wildlife. And I really want to applaud them for the work they did in the early stages. But there was one other organization, and the coordinator again of the wildlife clubs, and actually the founding coordinator are both here today. The wildlife clubs of Kenya began when, rather like President Joma Kenyatta, a few kids, including Thierry and Joka, decided they wanted to go to Sibmoto National Park and see wildlife. They were so thrilled that when they came back, they asked the ministries to set up the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya. This is the story that needs to be told. Since then, over six million kids have been through the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya. On the 50th anniversary of the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya, which was held at Bomas of Kenya, I was delighted to see that almost every single person who stood up on that platform was a former member of the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya, including the Cabinet Secretary, Arnold Balala, including John Waithaka, who was then, by this time, Chairman of uh, Kenya Wildlife Service, including the coordinator of the Wildlife Clubs, Margaret Otieno, and many, many others. Now, what a testament. And I'm going to be making a point at the end that has been invisible throughout this entire story of how Kenya has actually become one of the most conservation-conscious organizations, countries anywhere in the world. So let me now go through a series of resets and also failures. I've said that the Wildlife Department was a failure. And what brought it to a head was the gunning down of four, five white rhinos in Meru National Park and a number of rangers and even worse than that, and this is something we'll be taking up again and again through this talk, the bandits turned on tourists. And they gunned down French tourists in Meru National Park, others going into Savo National Park, and so on. Our entire tourist industry was in peril because poaching was out of hand. So let's go to the first reset. And again, I want to make the point that we've always moved forward with good ideas in Kenya, but we've always reached a point at which something brings us back, and that was the Wildlife Department. So the first reset that I'm going to talk about is creating a new agency, a sterling agency, namely the Kenya Wildlife Service. And a number of us in those days were very privileged to get to the president and convince them that within 
that original policy of 1977 was actually the word the Kenya Wildlife Service and the intent was there always to make it semi-autonomous. So the president agreed to make Kenya Wildlife Service a semi-autonomous organization. And it was created with a great deal of fanfare through my predecessor at that time, Richard Leakey. There were many good ideas. One of them was to try and make Kenya Wildlife Service financially independent of government and to be able to raise its own funds. But the most important point of all about Kenya Wildlife Service, and I think everyone here recognizes that at the time, was it established a crack ranger force, unsurpassed by any other in Africa. They were well armed, they were well trained, they had an air wing, an air service, they had communications, and it was this remarkable force that took on the shifter at that time, outgunned, outmaneuvered, and eventually quieted them down and began to turn the situation around for Kenya's wildlife. And the reason that was important too is it sent a signal out to the rest of the world that Kenya is once again safe for tourism. Another aspect of it, and this was through a series of exemptions, is that Kenya Wildlife Service was able to employ a number of very professional people from the private sector and to really re-engineer Kenya Wildlife Service as a professional organization. But the seminal document, to me, was the thing called the pause document, the pause policy document. This was not formal policy, and again I'll make this point repeatedly, it was not formal policy, it was informal policy that Kenya Wildlife Service, as a semi-autonomous organization, could get on and do the business it felt was necessary, unimpeded by government. And pause had a very important component in it. And that was going back to and picking up where the policy of 1977 left off and was never implemented, namely to now try and engage communities. The Kenya government and the World Bank put considerable money into that fund to help support communities in important wildlife areas, whether it was Amboseli, Samburu, Masai Mara, all over. And it was an important step, it was an important message. The Kenya government, through this new organization, is intent on bringing communities into wildlife. It had a big effect. So the successes of Kenya Wildlife Service at that point were first of all that it took up what the policy had left off and began to engage communities in conservation. Perhaps the most signature, the most important signature of Kenya Wildlife Service was taking on the out of control ivory trade. Burning ivory and sending a signal out to the rest of the world that Kenya will not endorse the ivory trade. It will burn all its ivory rather than sell it. And that had a huge effect internationally in mobilizing other peoples that an African government was willing to sacrifice millions of dollars worth of ivory in order to promote the ban. As a result of the ban, as a result of the Kenya Wildlife Service forces, poaching began to decline. Elephants, which had bottomed out at 19,000 from that 144,000, began slowly to increase in the 1990s. But also because Kenya Wildlife Service became a professional organization, it was able to look at an even more imperiled species, that's the rhino, the black rhino, and said, looking all over Africa, looking at the history of the white rhino in South Africa, which bottomed out at only 100, 000, sorry, 100 in the 1920s and then grew to 20,000. But the way to conserve our rhinos is not in the big open national parks. It's to put our rhinos into smaller protected areas, rhino sanctuaries. And since that time, the rhinos have increased from 350, from, they dropped from about 20,000 two decades earlier. They've since doubled and continue to increase. This is the legacy of the Kenya Wildlife Service. Tourism was safe. And Kenya, from being a pariah on the world stage, now became really an acclaimed leader in conservation. But I now want to turn to some of the failures of Kenya Wildlife Service, because again, we'll see these occurring time and again. The biggest one, and everyone since admitted, including the World Bank, which was very party to this, is the assumption that Kenya Wildlife Service could be financially self-sufficient. No national park system anywhere in the world generates enough money from the parks to be able to provide 
all those services. Only five national parks were earning money sufficient to carry the cost of the national parks. We have 29 parks and reserves. All the others were a sink on Kenya Wildlife Service. But here's the additional problem. Kenya Wildlife Service was not simply about parks. Under law, it was mandated to protect wildlife throughout the country. Worse than that, or better than that, depending on which way you look at it, and this is by the time I came into Kenya Wildlife Service, it was expected on the basis of the success of Kenya Wildlife Service that it would protect tourists all over the country, not just wildlife. And I'm referring to our police forces, our GSU and others. They were not brought into protecting tourists. It was Kenya Wildlife Service, which all over the country was expected to protect tourists and to maintain a tourist industry. So how can Kenya Wildlife Service possibly be financially self-sufficient given these non-renumerative services it's providing? And finally, in 1997, that's when things really hit the wall and showed the fallacy of believing that Kenya Wildlife Service can be financially self-dependent. Tourism collapsed because of banditry, because of attacks at the coast, and it dropped 50% in a mere six months. And I was left literally holding the bag and trying to argue with the government at exactly the time when the government and the World Bank stopped supplementing Kenya Wildlife Service, that we have to do something drastic. The $50 million endowment that the World Bank had guaranteed they would put up for Kenya Wildlife Service to see it through bad times was simply not there. So Kenya Wildlife Service has been left high and dry, <clears throat> and we'll see that it's in exactly the same position today. And I'm looking at the assistant director down here and saying, Hola, Sana. <clears throat> but there are two other issues that really had an injurious effect on Kenya Wildlife Service, I have to say. First, because it was so effective on um, anti-poaching of elephants in particular, there were helicopters flying in wherever there was a poaching. Wonderful. But the moment a person was killed, there was not even a letter of sympathy from Kenya Wildlife Service. So there was the belief that Kenya Wildlife Service, call it government, whatever you like to call it, was more concerned about elephants than people. And this is another problem we're still facing today. But the real issue of Kenya Wildlife Service at this point was that overreach. It was trying to do everything everywhere, and the overreach was in trying to take over the county council reserves, and in particular Maasai Mara. And that led to 13 different counties coming out against Kenya Wildlife Service and calling for change. <clears throat> and again, I want to make this point about the counties, because then it was a voluntary move by counties. Today, under law, under the Constitution, we'll see that the counties are mandated to plan land. We have no option. All right. So I'm going to go through to the second reset and say, look, Kenya Wildlife Service has done a great job. It's really involved communities. It's done all the outreach, all the right things. But there were some fundamental problems. So how do we reset once again? At that point, I was able to argue with the president very effectively that Kenya Wildlife Service should be fully released from the State Corporations Act. It should be fully independent. It should not be a State Corporations Act. And for a considerable period of time, Kenya Wildlife Service enjoyed that freedom to create a very professional staff, to raise the salaries to the level that it wished, and in particular, the rangers at the bottom end who were paid at the same level as Kenya police. Against great resistance, we raised it very much higher than the police and gave really the rangers who were the people and still are the people who face the bandits some credit. Secondly, one of the important things was to review what was emerging as a major crisis at that time, human-wildlife conflict. Populations are building up over Kenya, shambas are spreading, farms are spreading, elephants are losing their fear of people by now because of the ivory ban, they're spreading out and conflict is building up. So we launched a five-person independent review committee to travel all over Kenya and ask the question, what do you see as the future for wildlife? And an even more fundamental question that has never been asked in Kenya, who owns wildlife? I hear time and time again 
both in Kenya and even when I travel to Kenya and to Tanzania, that wildlife belongs to the government. It doesn't. It belongs to the people of Kenya. And that's a very big difference. But that was the perception. But here's the thing that came back from this human wildlife conflict review, and it surprised me. Most people on the ground said, we do not want privatized wildlife in Kenya like in South Africa. Because if you now devolve to local communities the rights to get involved in wildlife, we believe that a very large number of communities will abuse that privilege and will poach and destroy wildlife and then the rest of us will suffer. What we want to do is for the government to come up with a new policy which devolves the rights to wildlife use linked to responsibilities. Rights linked to responsibilities. So that allowed us to really restructure Kenya Wildlife Service at a time when Kenya had also signed the Convention on, uh, sorry, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Switching its thinking about wildlife from the big five, big five tourism, to all wildlife, including plants, and a commitment by the Kenya government to conserve that biodiversity. So it fell to Kenya Wildlife Service as the only agent at that point, and the signatory under CITES, to really come up with a biodiversity policy. And again, a great deal of criticism of Kenya Wildlife Service at the time in moving from wildlife only to biodiversity. Secondly, and John, you brought this up right at the beginning in the President's speech, in the President's pledge, partnerships. If we're going to devolve the rights and responsibilities, we have to have entities we can devolve wildlife to. And those became first and foremost the landowner associations who were then legalized, given rights, responsibilities, and were able, into, able to enter into contractual agreement with tour operators and others on how they would manage wildlife. Landowner associations will see are really the lifeblood of Kenya today. But there are other organizations that come into being, which we encouraged as we devolved the rights and responsibilities. FONAP. Now, who is here from FONAP? I know there's someone here representing FONAP. The idea was to take our national parks and make them a living entity for the people around national parks and to create friends of national parks and help Kenya Wildlife Service and the government manage our national parks and give them a feeling that they were involved. Now I know that FONAS have ups and downs, but I really believe that every single national park should have friends of no national park. And I really want to commend FONAP for the work that it's done over these many, many years. I just hope that you can create similar templates in Savo, in Samburu, and many others, because that's involves the communities. Secondly, and I'm going to run through this next list very quickly, we created parks for Kenyans. Because I was acutely aware, living right on the edge of Nairobi National Park, that we seldom saw an indigenous Kenyan going to the national parks. The prices were very high for Kenyans. So what we did is we lowered the price for citizens. And on the 50th anniversary of Kenya Wildlife Service, with the president present, we said we're opening the national parks free of charge today for any Kenyan to go in. Now, lo and behold, people with Mercedes Benz came into a national park as if they couldn't afford it. Why? Because there was a perception that parks was for other people and not for Kenyans. And so from that day on, we also began to get corporations to take groups into the parks and so on. The second major point was the idea of parks beyond parks. That so much wildlife was outside national parks, if we could give the rights and responsibilities to communities under this brand of parks beyond parks, we could encourage them to go into partnerships with tour operators, with conservation organizations and so on. We linked that with the idea of training up the first 60 scouts in Kenya. These are community scouts trained to the same level as Kenya Wildlife Service to protect their wildlife in their own areas. I'm looking again at John because he has a long history here, John Maithaka. We also tried to cut a dependency that had built up a Kenya Wildlife Service for good reasons but that had a bad effect. Namely that these wildlife funds the Kenya Wildlife Service gave out to communities created a dependency on Kenya Wildlife Service as though it were another donor. And so eventually this became, if you like, a weapon that the communities were able to use and say, unless you give us more money, we're going to really rebel. And in many cases they did. 
So we persuaded the European Union, and I really hope other donors here follow this lead that they had at that time, to create two funds, independent funds, independent of the Canyon Life Service. The first was the Biodiversity Conservation Program, which John headed up. $5 million to encourage any community anywhere to create their own wildlife entities with any partner. It was a competitive system. Anyone could apply. They could even use KWS as a partner, and many did. The other was even more significant. It was the Tourism Trust Fund, a fund of some $25 million that helped bring about a more diversified portfolio under our policy. But secondly, again invited communities to set up ecotourist lodges and funded some of the first, including Ilingwesi, the first of the community areas in northern Kenya. And then finally, we also set up a thing called the Minimum Viable Conservation Area, recognizing that we cannot protect wildlife everywhere. Wildlife with so much of Kenya is very thin on the ground. A very small percentage of our area contains the majority of our wildlife. So within those areas, we should think about how we conserve minimally those populations intact for all time. The minimum viable conservation area. How to maximize the area covered, or rather the wildlife covered for the minimum area that would be under some sort of protection. Then again, we had a seminal meeting here at Safari Park called Ecotourism at the Crossroads, recognizing that Kenya had really created its own trap again in the success of Big Five tourism inherited from sport hunting Big Five, and you know who the Big Five are. And so our national parks became inundated with minibus safaris. For anyone who remembers those days, you would see 30, 40 minibuses around a lion. Cheetahs were being pushed out of national parks to protect their cubs. It was chaos. It was creating a reputation for Kenya as the Costa Brava of the wildlife world. Hit and run, you know, thousands of tourists coming in, they're moving on to the next destination. Here's the critical issue. Our tourist earnings dropped to one third of what they had been because we were providing bigger and bigger lodges at thinner and thinner margins. And the lodges went up to 150 and 200 inside our national parks. It was unsustainable. So that tourism of the crossroads recognized that there was just the beginnings in Kenya of a new approach, which we call ecotourism. And it was beginning to diversify the tourism to culture, historical landscapes, and other things that I'll take up at the end of this meeting. It also created two other entities. And these entities you will see are very important in carrying the burden of conservation and wildlife. Namely, it created the Kenya Tourism Federation, which came out of that meeting, and the Ecotourism Society of Kenya, which then established standards for tourism, which were the benchmark, if you like, of what the tourism began to operate. From this point, beginning with the first iteration of Kenya Wildlife Service and the second, what has been most important have been what we now call the conservancies. And John has already mentioned that they grew from just a tiny handful in the early 90s to over 150 today all over the country, protecting 11% of the area and intimately engage with, for, and on behalf of the communities. That's been the success. And they operated informally, experimentally, for a good 15-year period. And I want to point back to that period of experimentation. There was no regulation. Every single community, with its partners, tried different things to see what worked. And we had a whole flowering of different ideologies and approaches and so on. And that's what's created the very diversity of Kenya's ecotourist industry. It's very distinct from what you see in South Africa, where there's almost a sort of cookie cutter approach to wildlife. It then led ultimately to the Kenya Wildlife Conservancy Association, which I hope is here, which then represents all those members. But here's another point that hasn't been made public very widely and something which we did for the policy several years ago. We looked at the fate of wildlife in those new conservancies compared with the national parks and found that our national parks, like wildlife throughout the country, was in sharp decline. Inside most of the conservancies, wildlife, because of the protection of the rangers, community scouts, was now beginning to increase. And I'll just mention Amboselia. 
by the end of the poaching period in 1977, in Amboseli, when the communities began to get remuneration from the National Park, they began to employ their own scouts. They began to be the eyes and ears. Amboseli was the only area anywhere in Kenya, 1977, the height of the poaching crisis, where the elephant population turned around and began to increase because it was under the custodianship of the local people. Finally, elephants and rhinos make a resounding recovery. And I do want to stress this because throughout this recent elephant crisis, beginning in 2008, Kenya has lashed itself, saying we're losing elephants. We haven't. We've been gaining elephants. From 1989, today, our elephants have increased from 19,000 to something like 38,000. That is a singular success. But I'm going to counterpoise that against an almighty failure about why the rest of our wildlife is going down while elephants are going up. So just to summarize, the failures are we hit the financial crisis. We began to devolve, but we stole during this period. And in particular, what really affected Kenya Wildlife Service in the coming years is the instability of so many different directors coming in and going out. It became a political turnstile. There was no stability. The exemption that it joined from the State Corporations Act was withdrawn, and again, it was a state corporation. And we began to see demoralization of staff with the turnover. We lost a clear mission of what that conservation was all about, what Kenya Wildlife Service should be doing and how it should evolve, and so on. That began to turn around with the Wildlife Act of 2013. But here again is the problem. You don't have an act before you have a policy. And policy has not, there hasn't been a new policy in Kenya since 1977, despite all the changes I'm going to mention and all the challenges we face today. No new policy. So when you come out with a Wildlife Act, and you begin to read that act, it's one thing after another about regulations and prohibitions and don't do this and don't do that. There's hardly a word in there about the incentives to get involved in conservation. So again, despite the recovery of elephants, one organization, and I hope again they're represented here, which has been a silent part of throughout, is the Department of Regional Surveys and Remote Sensing, DRSRS. It's been monitoring our wildlife population since 1977. And what it shows is that the wildlife populations, with the exception of elephants and rhinos recently, have declined 60%. And work which I did shortly afterwards showed that even in our national parks, our wildlife has declined to the same extent. Why? Because the migrations moving out of parks are affected by population pressures, by agriculture, and all the other things that are taking down wildlife outside. So what we've ignored over the last 10 years, despite all our successes, is one particular phenomenon. Most of our wildlife exists in the rangelands. The rangelands are in crisis exactly the same as wildlife. Because as the human population is built up, there are too few livestock for people to subsist as they did in subsistence. They're beginning to sell land, subdivide land. They're beginning to lose the quality of their livestock. Based on work that I've done in Amboseli over the last 45 years, <clears throat> before there's any climate change, and this is the point that I want to make, our grasslands in Amboseli, because of persistent heavy grazing, have declined one third in terms of production for the same amount of rainfall. The issue at this time is the degradation of the rangelands, and it's very similar to what happened in the United States in the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Unregulated, the traditional systems are broken down, people are moving everywhere. We've seen a huge switch from cattle economy to sheep and goat. And every single time we go through a drought, people then import cattle. The sheep and goat increase so much faster than cattle ever did, that as we go through those droughts, wildlife declines, livestock increases, and we're going through this jigsaw over time. We've ignored the very important fact that the very pastoral people who are the custodians of wildlife are now suffering for exactly the same reasons of wildlife. Population growth, subdivision, agricultural expansion, and more particularly, the lack of valuation for wildlife relative to livestock. 
All right, so I'm now going to move forward to the, the final reset. The third reset. So bear in mind these lessons we've learned throughout. There are some seminal things that Kenya Lice has done. It's taken some extraordinary measures to change the nature of conservation. And again, think back on what our first president said. But let's do three things, four things. First of all, we've got to take stock at this time of where we stand, not hide the problems under a rug. Secondly, we've got to focus on what we can do, what we have that is most important. And then having done that, two things which we've done but never gone the full distance on, devolve, involve Kenyans, and finally something we've never done before, integrate wildlife with other forms of land use. So taking stock, you know, I'm always impressed whenever I come back to Kenya, having been to the Rockies and all these great countries around the world, the Andes in South America. You know, if we're going to sell Kenya, it's not just wildlife. We don't just have the greatest wildlife populations on Earth. We have the Great Lakes. We have the Great Mountains. We have the Great Rift. We have extraordinary coral reefs. We have among the richest cultures on Earth, 43 different ethnic cultures who have a very rich tradition of relating to nature. There's another thing that didn't emerge until recently. When people began to look at biodiversity, when they began to look at hotspots around the world, they always said, where are the hotspots? Inevitably, they came out as a forest because if you think about the number of plants and the number of insects, these are biodiversity hotspots. But when you look at vertebrates, fish, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, where do you think comes out the richest on Earth? Vertebrates. Those big animals that are the architects of the ecosystems. East Africa, bar none. This is the richest place for vertebrate diversity anywhere on Earth. And we haven't taken advantage of it. Then again, we have something extraordinary. We have a long history of people coexisting with wildlife. How did they do that? How did they manage to coexist with wildlife despite them seemingly being enemies of people and despite the fact that everywhere on Earth, Europe, North America, Australia, they had eliminated the mega mammals. This is the last place on Earth where you have these grand populations of large mammals virtually intact. So let's now focus. And here, Lucy Warawengi, I want to congratulate you and all of those who put together what should be the focus of wildlife in Kenya. You've done the work for us, and that is the National Wildlife Conservation for Strategy for Kenya. Over the last two and three years, the Kenya government, and again I want to really make this point, gave it to a coalition of organizations, governments, universities, NGOs, and others to pull together a national wildlife strategy. And what came out of that, I wish we could show this beautiful picture on the front, is a remarkable document. A strategy for how to move forward over the next five years to conserve wildlife. So look at the four things that came out of that as the major goals. And I think you'll see that those have been redounding all the way through our Kenyan history. Resilient ecosystems is number one. We have to think about ecosystems and how to conserve those over time, even in the face of climate change. Otherwise, they will be swept aside by climate change. Secondly, engage all Kenyans. All Kenyans. Thirdly, evidence-based decisions. Now, I have to say as a scientist, but also a conservationist, I have been dismayed over the years by how much Kenya has been captured by philosophy, by opinion, and so on and so forth. We've had discussions up in Meru talking about the future of wildlife, where NGOs internationally have trucked in Kenya, the youth from Kenya, to drown debate among Kenyans on the future of its own wildlife. This must be something that is based on evidence, not opinion. Throughout this last number of years, we've had any number of international NGOs saying, Kenya's wildlife elephants are going down. Give us money and we'll conserve elephants in Kenya. Ian, you were one of the few people who stood up and said, we're doing pretty well. But here's what we need to do involving communities. And you did a great job. Thank you. So the other one, and again, you'll recognize it from what we said in the past as success, 
is governance and partnerships. Governance and partnerships. Who is the governance? It's setting up bodies to which we can devolve these rights and responsibilities and institutions of different colors and different blends, tour operators, local communities, NGOs, universities and others, partnerships. And again, there's another point that comes out, which is harking back to what you've heard before. MVCA, a minimum viable conservation area. The time has come, <coughs> based on the evidence, <coughs> excuse me, to look at where our wildlife really is and to protect the majority where we can do so. <coughs> and I would make the point that DRSRS, all the way through as that silent partner, has been auditing and monitoring our wildlife and should, should be doing exactly that in the coming five years when we decide the majority, where the majority of wildlife is. They should be monitoring that wildlife every single year, not every five years. Despite the fact we still haven't got a new policy, 42 years later, has done a great deal of that work. Devolve. I'm sorry for all of those who will say we do not intend to devolve. This is a different time, this is a different era. Our constitution is very clear. We shall devolve to the lowest efficient and effective level the rights and responsibilities over our natural resources. If you have any doubt, just go and look at the Environmental Management Coordination Act, which I helped, among others, to rewrite. It's very clear. The principle of subsidiarity devolving to the lowest effective and efficient level is the principle for all natural resource management in Kenya. Wildlife cannot be exempted from that. There's no provision within the Constitution to do so. But then again, Let's go back to the counties who protested so much and had such a big impact in Kenya Wildlife Service in the 1990s. Under the Constitution, the counties today have the mandate for land planning, and all of them are beginning that process. Unless, within the next two, three, four years, we work with the counties and we plan the land such that settlement areas here, agricultural area, livestock and wildlife areas here, there will be no land left outside the national parks, according to the county councils, that have a place for wildlife. But I have to say that the counties are recognizing the importance of tourism. Narok and Kajiado have since combined to one economic unit. They have about 40% of the wildlife in Kenya, and they recognize why planning to include wildlife within spatial planning is important. Now, the good thing about devolution is that we were ready for it long before time. Kenya Wildlife Service had already regionalized into eight different regions to bring management closer to the communities. We had set up the landowner associations, of which there are now dozens, like Kipia Wildlife Forum, Northern Region Trust, Ambassador Ecosystem Trust, South Rift Association of Land. I could go on and on and on. They're there. That is what I call the tertiary level of governance. We have the government level, we have the county level below that, there's the all-important landowner who forms these associations. Then again, we've got a prolific growth of NGOs, and they've brought to, been brought together under the Conservation Alliance of Kenya to help support so many of these programs and to really bring some degree of professionalism to planning in Kenya. I also want to recognize that every move to planning for biodiversity and wildlife, this institution, the National Museums of Kenya is the repository for biodiversity. Just go into the, um, the back here, into the collections, and it's extraordinary varieties of birds and mammals and insects. <clears throat> it's now putting all that online. The Kenya Wildlife Service has to think about other partners like the National Museums, the Fisheries Department, the Forestry Department, to create an integrated approach to biodiversity. So let me come to what might offend a lot of people the future of Kenya Wildlife Service. This is the sterling agency we set up. They have an albatross around their neck. The compensation, not for loss of life, I have full agreement with that, for crops and livestock. It is unmanageable. Kenya Wildlife Service is now looking, correct me if I'm wrong, Charles, at 800 million backlog in payments. Correct? Eight billion. Sorry, eight billion, eight billion in backlog. 
the government's only providing a quarter of that. And so what has happened is that people all over the country who have filed for loss of crops, loss of livestock, are angry, incredibly angry. And they're pointing a finger at Kenya Life Service, which frankly is not the problem. The problem is government really, through parliament, forced this condition, and Kenya Life Service is now facing the music. I would prefer to see us, and I know that you're having a retreat fairly shortly to think about the way forward on this, to think about insurance as an alternative that really involves people directly in the responsibility for their own crops and livestock and takes it. Because again, we've built a dependency in so many communities think, well, if an elephant comes in and damages my crop, I'll make a claim. Well, it hasn't happened, but again, it's created dependency, which I don't think we can continue with. Secondly, how many species do we have in Kenya of plants and animals? 35,500. How many of those are covered by any schedule and the Kenya Wildlife Service? About 350, about 1%. That means all those other plants and animals are being used in one way or another by Kenya without any regulations, without any restriction. We're not worried about them because they're not endangered. So I think the time has come really under the Wildlife Act to really rethink these schedules and to release, if you like, the potential for Kenya to use what they've always considered and must necessarily be their natural resource. So let me just give you one example. If you're on a private ranch, who owns the grass which the cattle are using? The rancher, correct? If you go into a pastoral area today, it's as though that belongs to wildlife. And that has to be regulated. In other words, the grass has to be regulated under the Wildlife Act. We cannot have a Wildlife Act that includes all 35 species under wildlife. We've got to think about how to devolve that. We also have to think about whether or not we go the next step beyond what Kenya's decided in 1995 about who owns wildlife and think about some degree of privatization. I know a lot of people shake their heads and say no. 99% of all our species are already privatized. They're already being used in one form or another. It's that 1% that we have to worry about. That 1% worries me as much as anybody else, particularly when it comes to elephants, rhinos, giraffe, and many other endangered species, lions included. We don't have an Endangered Species Act, which cedes the authority of those species to the government to protect and comes up with rules and regulations that are also beneficial to the landers. We do not have an Endangered Species Act. So it's not surprising that this confusion about who owns wildlife and what responsibilities they have. Now, finally, I want to come to third generation national parks. The first national park created in 1872 was Yellowstone, grand monument of nature. And that's what the Americans did. They were thought about these grand cathedrals like the Yellowstone, Tetons, and all the rest of it. It wasn't for wildlife. And they protected those, and they brought in tourists. But they were set aside intact. The second generation actually began with Amboseli, recognizing that we cannot conserve parks without an ecosystem. We have to involve communities. And so we did. The third generation is the signatures coming through from government. Government cannot afford to underwrite Ken <coughs> Kenya Wildlife Service to the extent it is at the moment. The staffing in Kenya Wildlife Service was 3,700 when I left. We took it down from 5,500. Why? Because there are community scouts all over the country who number more almost than national park scouts themselves. I know that John is very concerned about this one. Can we really protect 59 parks and reserves, is it John? 60. There are so many paper parks all over Kenya. If you look at the third generation park, as I call them, what would that involve? It would mean that Kenya Wildlife Service, as with other forms of wildlife management, can devolve to people, other than Kenya Wildlife Service, to manage our wildlife estates. Obviously, on private lands, it's already being done. But why not protected areas? It's already being done in many places in the world. In Australia, Kakadu National Park, Aborigines are co-managing with the national park system. Mozambique, where they can't afford it, and Nyasa. Even the Congo Republic has given out concession to NGOs to manage the national parks.
But here's the difference. Yes, it's cutting the cost of government, but there must be established standards for that devolution, standards by which you devolve to others, and also to monitor and audit their performance, exactly the same as Kenya Wildlife Service, according to us, should be monitored. <clears throat> so John Wathaka recently took a cabinet secretary, principal secretary, and several others to Canada to see how one of the best national park systems in the world works. And here's how it works. They come up with a five-year plan. That plan has to be approved by Parliament. The moment that plan is approved, it has a budget for five years. So it can carry out all the functions that is required. And we can't then turn around to Kenya Wildlife Service and say, you've been starved to death. The first next step is involve. I want to just make the point that we have to mobilize the public. The Wildlife Clubs of Kenya celebrated 50 years a short while ago. It was delightful to see how many, as I've said before, the people on that podium had been through the Wildlife Clubs. I would like to see the Wildlife Clubs take on an even bigger role, supported by governments, the NGOs, and others. We have a tremendous amount of indigenous knowledge and practice, which under the Constitution is ratified. We have to look back to that and think about how we can use those principles in future. Here's another one, and it reminds me of what is here today. Shirley, my wife here, up at Ilpale School, called in an artist and said, why not teach the kids some art, kids who had never done any art before? And what they did is some of these wonderful art here, illustrating medicinal plants which the Maasai use. And they produced a wonderful little booklet called Olkane, Medicinal Plants Among the Maasai. I put to the previous principal secretaries, and I hope this is going to be taken up again, why not have a competition Kenya-wide for the national plant? And why not have that for every single county, 47 counties? Think about all the different groups who think this is our plant, like the kikuyus, the fig tree, and so on and so forth. Why not have a national competition, similar to this, going out to all the schools? Let's illustrate the important plants, what uses they have, what folklore there is about that, and produce a booklet. And finally, bring together some of the renowned Kenyans, sportsmen, businessmen, conservationists, and have a competition to select the national plant of Kenya. I can't think of anything else that would really bring Kenyans into the fold that our biodiversity is important. One of the most important advances I've seen, in addition to the scouts in Kenya, has been the establishment of what we call the resource assessors. These are young kids who left school, who now go out, like our apologists, our colleagues did in the past, myself included, and are recording all the natural resources in the area, the grasses, wildlife, livestock, cattle markets, and so on and so forth. This young cadre of resource assessors are our scientists on the ground for the future. And then finally, the African Parks Protected Areas Association, because of John Waithaka, is being held here in Kenya in November. This is the first time any African Protected Area Congress has ever been held. This is a chance to showcase what we've had and how we work. So finally, integration. And I want to go back to tourism and just say that we have been trapped by our own success on the Big Five. We have to go way beyond the Big Five to those diverse environments, cultures, history, the older history on Earth that I mentioned. If we do that, and this is a figure we worked out some years ago, the carrying capacity for tourism in Kenya is going to increase fivefold. Think of all the areas outside, recreational tourism, cultural tourism, historical, prehistory. I could go on and on and on. If we had continued with the Big Five, our carrying capacity would have been determined by how many lions we have, how many minibuses you can squeeze around a single pride of lions, and how willing the tourist was to tolerate that. That's the difference between what we did and what we can do. Secondly, we have to move from just counting wildlife to counting our natural capital. All of the resources, our soils, our water, our forests, that are the underpinning of 70% of our production in Kenya. And I would propose once again the Department of Range, uh, Remote Sensing and Regional Surveys here already has the capacity to do that. 
and like many countries, and Kenya has already signed on to an international convention to do this, we should be monitoring the state of our natural capital and our ecological services every five years. And then we need to scale up from our parks to our ecosystems to cross-boundary areas like the Kenya-Tanzania boundary through the Borderland Conservation Initiative between the two governments, the NGOs, the communities to protect these free-ranging herds, elephants, lions, giraffe, and many others. And I'm just going to finish with two very quick examples. We have some excellent demonstrations of how this devolution, about how this involvement, this engagement has really worked out. The Northern Rangeland Trust and all that it's done to protect wildlife and engage communities. The Myra Conservancies. I had huge hesitation about the subdivision of lands and how it would destroy wildlife. But because of the value of wildlife in Masai Mara, the communities are combined with the tour operators and the NGOs, and they're now conserving wildlife. Subdivided lands. Subdivision is not the end. If we value wildlife and we bring together those partners. The South Rift Association of Landowners combines all the landowners between Amboseli and Masai Mara trying to create that great landscape, first of all to improve the quality of livestock, to secure the land against alienation, and to protect wildlife and to create new tourist industries. Since 2000, the South Rift Association of Landowners, which had no elephants, regularly record 400 which have moved into that area. Lions only number 10 in 2000. John, I don't know what the figure is today, but I know you're an export commodity. You've got about 50, 60 lions, and they're now moving out across the South Rift. This is an area without a national park. This is a community which is doing it for own's benefit. And finally, I want to finish with where I began, Amboseli. Amboseli has taken a huge step forward since 2004 in creating an Amboseli ecosystem management plan with the landowners, with the Kenya Wildlife Service, with the NGOs, with all the different agencies. Having that formally gazetted by the Attorney General's Chambers so that you cannot have random development. And Amboseli at the moment is in the next step, which working with the county and the spatial planning is having the Amboseli Ecosystem Management Plan adopted by the county as the framework for its spatial planning. So there'll be agriculture here, settlement there, livestock, and so on over here, and also trying to improve the quality of livestock. That also will be gazetted. It will be the first of its kind. So the point about integration is we cannot any longer think about wildlife in isolation. It's always been a privileged commodity in Kenya. I want to end by saying I'm actually delighted looking around this room when a single indigenous Kenyan came up to the end and said, let's think about how we can move this forward. And when that one gentleman came up and said, this is the last bastion of communism, I asked the question, how far have we come? We've come an enormous distance, but we still have a large step to go. And again, I'm going to say this, despite having been in government, the time has come for government to recognize that it cannot isolate wildlife from other natural resources in Kenya. We must evolve, we must involve, we must fully value wildlife. Only when we do that will we reach the state that the United States is in at the moment. They went through 50 years of asking that same question, who owns wildlife? And they ended up somewhere in between, not national, not private, the state, the equivalent of a county, has really a great deal of say about how wildlife is managed. I think we can go a great deal further than that because I think that our landowner associations are really now fully mature, fully developed, and I am delighted that the NGOs, despite a lot of concerns, perhaps in Kenya Life Service, that they're getting the lion's share of the money, are really being supported by the international NGOs. But bear in mind this. If they weren't doing that, Kenya Wildlife Service would have to deploy 7,000 rangers all over the country to protect wildlife. So long as those associations and their partners are able to protect wildlife for their own benefit, for their own good, the role of Kenya Wildlife Service shrinks and becomes much, much more important, Charles. You become oversight, enabling, and enforcing.
you become the custodians, which you're supposed to be, in seeing what can be done effectively. Thank you. The reason why I'm here today is because I've got passion for wildlife because uh, most of our wildlife are uh, becoming endangered and it is a high time that we need to take action because there are the small actions that citizens do that make change. We have to learn more about uh, conservation, mainly in Africa, and also restoration, how we can restore the ecosystem that have been degraded in Africa. Well, I've been following Dr. Weston's work for many years and he's done amazing work, amazing research on wildlife and community involvement in wildlife. He was one of the first to state about, you know, involving communities in wildlife conservation. Two things really stood out. One is the role of the communities and the private landowners. My best part is the part by the time uh, Dr. Western analyzed the achievement that Kenya Wildlife Service has engaged in, in uh, conservation of wildlife. It's really interesting to hear from him the dynamics of wildlife, space and people.